Well, good evening, beloved brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and, and I will say this going in. We, there's so much developed now in the series of, of classes. We will just give a, a, a lot of prophetic quotes. You can very well read the record on your own, the last two chapters, and fill it in. It just becomes so obvious. Um, but as we like to do sometimes, start with a principle and a quote regarding that, where the Apostle Paul says, and this is even the Apostle Paul, let alone brethren <clears throat> of our community today, and not that we would have dominion over your faith, but helpers of your joy. For by faith ye stand. And you know what he says in 1 Corinthians 2. I become nothing more than expounding the word. <clears throat> and it's to that authority that we seek. Um, and my emphasis here is a little bit different, but uh, I use a lot of quotes from our pioneer brethren. It's interesting. This is one of the quotes I get requested of a brethren to send the most because of what it says. Because Brother Roberts wrote it regarding Brother Thomas, saying that he not only gives you his conclusions, and this is the part that I think is the most significant, but the reasons that led him to those conclusions. And I've said that to brethren that are studying Eureka, that if you're not really even looking at the depth of the history, look at the principal reasoning of which he's developing all of the symbols um, and it's, it's going to help so that we are able to make his conclusions our own by a process which makes us independent of all men as to the ground on which we hold them. The best proof of the soundness of the views we advance by Brother Thomas lies in this, that once the reader is directed by him to the Bible, and you know he says this in the introduction of Alpha's Israel, read it with the Bible in hand, dismiss it if you don't find it in accordance with it, and becomes a Bible student, he can dispense with Dr. Thomas' book altogether, so far as steadfastness, steadfastness, steadfastness of conviction is concerned. The Bible nourishes that conviction from day to day. The object is to, and this is why I quote it, is to create in all of us independent Bible students. That's all the community was really structured for. Because really, you're just not going to advance very far in the truth if you're not your own independent Bible student. <clears throat> if you're very limited in what you study, your understanding is going to be very limited. And the forward to Christendom astray has this note. The single objective of the author is to promote the personal study of the holy scriptures with a view to salvation. So even when it comes from works that help us, the emphasis is the Bible. And that is emphasized over and over again. And then in the red quote, um, I've stated there, and we do frequently quote uh, brethren that have helped us, that others might be directed to the same resources and the same works. Our intent is not to exalt men because you can dispatch of their works once you've come to an understanding. <clears throat> but we do respect them as laborers in word and in doctrine. And one of the reasons, and I think I've said this before, especially for younger brethren. I'm in my 50s, and there, there is a good number of brethren in their 20s and 30s and their 40s that almost have never heard much of Brother Thomas and Brother Roberts and all the brethren that you hold dear. And back to the early 30s and 40s, I'm talking about the 1930s and 40s, uh, even into the 50s and 60s in your era and in your area, the same as ourselves. And, and they're just not familiar with them. And so citing them is not the exaltation of man. It's to get them back to an understanding of where they can find some study aids that are going to lead them to the Bible because they have to become Bible students. So we had Brother Terry read for us the first five verses, um, which will carry us through the end of the book today, God willing. And our subject matter is the Jews redeemed and the kingdom now grows, which is one of the end verses that he had read for us. And this happens in the month of Adar, which my understanding is the sixth civil month. That's significant. When the king's commandment is decreed, drew near to put in execution in the day that the enemies of the Jews, their intent is to destroy them, but it was turned to the contrary. And now the Jews have rule over those that hated them. And that is what the world is going to experience very, very shortly. 
they have been the subject of hatred for a long period of time. And so the prophets say, and here is just one of those, where the Gentiles will fear the Jews. The sons of all them that afflicted thee shall come bending unto thee. All they that despise thee will bow themselves down at the soles of thy feet. Can you imagine that time? When the city of Yahweh, Zion, the Holy One of Israel is one, the one that acknowledged. Whereas thou hast been forsaken and hated, that no man went through thee, I will make thee an eternal excellency. A joy of many generations and the suck of the milk of the Gentiles shall suck the breast of the kings. This is the status now when Israel is saved and redeemed, as the latter part of that quote goes on to say. Well, we just can't even quite get our heads around that and what we see in the world today. But it's all going to be lifted up by this one man, Mordecai, that was made a suffering servant and then exalted. All of this we understand from first principles. And really, that's all the meat of the word is, is you are taking an understanding of the milk <clears throat> of the first principle doctrine and applying it to extract the meat. And it is interesting, and I know we've said this before, brethren, and we'll expand on it here, that what we emphasize in first principle study with everyone, I certainly did with my daughters, is what we all do, and that's doctrine, the doctrine of the kingdom, the doctrine of the resurrection, the doctrine of Israel. And then after that period of time, we almost leave them to the Bible alone to grab little moral lessons out of them. But that's not what we stressed in first principles. We stress the doctrine. So when we go to the meat of the word, it is simply applying the doctrine of the milk principles. And so all the scriptures, are about the Jews and Israel and the Gentiles being grafted into them, which is what we teach in first principles. And so it says in verse two, the Jews gather themselves together in their cities throughout all the provinces of the king and Hazarus to lay hand on such as sought their hurt. No man could withstand them for the fear of them fell upon all people. Now, I used to say, I was corrected by an elder brethren, well, this is a complete reversal, I mean, and it really isn't. The fear of the Jews has always been upon the people. You get that from the Exodus, you get that from their entering the land, which is why they've been persecuted. Hitler feared them, but now they have one in total authority to stand for their defense. That's the difference. Thus saith Adonai, Yahweh, behold, I will lift up mine hand to the Gentiles and set my standard to the people. They shall bring thy sons in their arms, and thy daughter shall be carried upon their shoulders. And you know how that context goes on. They will come and seek the house of the God of Jacob. He will stand as an ensign for his people, Isaiah 11, and the Gentiles will now seek to it. He will cause the Gentiles to recognize his glory by the hand of Israel. And so that many people of the nation, Zechariah 8, these are all quotes from we are familiar with, will take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, because they now know the kingdom and authority that has now been placed in the earth has direct context to Israel and the Jew. And it is their only source of salvation. The people that were a byword who their enemies sought to destroy. Watch how this develops, and it's all what we know prophetically. So these political rulers, the provinces, lieutenants, deputies, officers of the king, helping the Jews, because the fear of this man that was once persecuted has been resurrected and given the king's ring and authority, because Mordecai fell upon them. This is now the, of the sheep nations, as Brother Thomas rightly calls them, the Gentile political figures, they are helping bring those sons from afar, the sons of the stranger, the forces of the Gentiles will be brought to them, that their king may be brought. That's a time that we have never seen in the earth. The nations will see it, says uh, Micah 7, and be confounded at all their might. They will lay their hand upon their mouth, and their ears shall be deaf. They shall lick the dust like a serpent. They shall move out of their holes like worms of the earth. They shall be afraid, and that word fear is dominant. 
It's used three times in Esther, especially in these latter chapters. They are afraid of Yahweh our Elohim, and they shall fear because of thee, says Micah. It's all throughout the prophets. It is fear. It is fear to the power and the authority that has been given Mordecai in defense of the Jews, and now the fear of the Jews. And that is used as a very, very strong word in the prophetic scriptures. These are a people that have been despised, that now this incredible Agag, Gogian host, and what we will see is 10 sons believe they could run over them. And really, by all temporal accountability, it looked like they should have been able to. Or Mordecai was great, and that's all that matters in the king's house. His fame was through all the provinces, all 127 of them, and he waxed greater and greater. That is only ever used elsewhere, brothers and sisters, as the kingdom of David growing in military and political and religious might. It appears in 1 Chronicles 11, verse 9. It is the Davidic kingdom that begins its magnificent growth, starting with the little kingdom of Judah. It's the same sort of figurative language we find in Daniel. The stone that smites the image is not one total final event. It becomes a great mountain and then it begins to fill the whole earth. So that when brethren look at Bible prophecy, it's Armageddon and then there's the setting up and then the wolf and the lion and they're going to eat straw like the ox and like the lamb. That's one piece of scripture is the end result. The details and the long process of which this is going to be accomplished, if that's all you get from Bible prophecy, you're going to be very, very confounded. I don't mean you. I mean anyone, any of us. We're going to be very, very confounded if that's the only detail we accept out of the development of the kingdom. There's tremendous warfare. And by the way, we'll get to this in a moment, brothers and sisters. Esther's at the forefront of this. We're not a passive people. So this fame, again, is used for the son of David when he begins his reign. His wisdom and his might are so well known, his fame is heard into the Gentile kingdoms. So much that the sheep nations of the queen of Sheba comes to hear of all his wisdom. And then we know what happens. There's partnership in building the temple and so on and so forth of the greater son of David, of which he was a type. So this language is incredibly prophetic. And during this period of time that Mordecai is growing in strength and might and power, and the fear that people are upon him, the Jews are smiting their enemies with the stroke of the sword, slaughter and destruction. Remember, brothers and sisters, if all we get from the scriptures is all the beauty and the paradise that is descriptive, Isaiah 35 and other pieces of scripture, Isaiah 11, where it's merely meadows, and every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and the beauty restored like unto Eden. Remember this, there's great slaughter and destruction against those that would hate them. It starts in Shushan, the palace, where the Jews begin this, slaying 500 men, and it's going to grow, we'll see from that. And we know what the sword represents. It's the word of the mouth of righteousness, and it means righteous judgment. And you know the scriptures that deal with that. And all the Jews that hated him, it's Agag, Gog, and all those affected by his influence. So it's this roaring forth that begins in the capital city, but then it develops after that. When Judah, says Zechariah 14, will fight at Jerusalem. And Yahweh will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And this is just the few, first few verses that Brother Terry had read for us. Look at the development. And it's not hard. Well, now look what happens. It's the European nations that have been under the influence of the Gogian power. It's now the ten sons of Haman. The enemy of the Jews that were slain but they didn't lay their hands upon the spoil. And we read that in our readings today. If you read it already, I believe it was Deuteronomy 6. 
And when you go through the land, you occupy the land, take your hand out upon the, the spoil because it represented the gods that the people served. The overcoming of the enemy doesn't have to do with the desire to seek their goods. That's not the desire of the Christadelphian. We want all the good stuff in the world. That's why we want to overtake them. That's not the burning desire of us. It's to see righteousness established and the enemies of Yahweh and his people brought low. So here are these figured a number of 10. And there were 10 nations that occupied the land, by the way. The feet and toes of Daniel, Daniel's image. We have it, of course, in Revel the Revelation. The 10 kings influenced by the Harlem system. So it's very, very significant. But look what happens in verse 13. Esther said, not Mordecai, not the Jews. This is you and I, brethren. This is the bride, the hidden Jew of the heart. Esther says, we're not passive people. Not toward this end. If it please the king, let it be granted to the Jews, which are in Shushan, to tomorrow, according to this day's decree, and let Haman's sons be hanged upon the gallows. Esther says that. The same character of this woman who is to be made bride instead of Vashti, who only required the king's purification in all her character and her righteousness and all the lovely things is the one that also, <clears throat> excuse me, is now pursuing military might against the 10 sons of Haman. And that's what I mean, brothers and sisters. We just read that in our readings as well. If my kingdom were of this world, said Christ, my servants would fight for it. The Bible is not objective to military battle at all. It does not object to it. The Bible is filled with it. It has to be done in righteousness against those that are just rot core evil. And that is the example many times of not just Mordecai, as the chapter begins, but Christ in the saints. If we suffer with him, we will reign with him and take part in the subduing of that. So the king commanded so it to be done. And the decree was given at Shushan, and they hanged Haman's ten sons. It's another hanging, brothers and sisters, in this book. So Gog destroyed, in Esther chapter 7, Haman hanged upon the tree. Now Christ sends forth the saving law to the Jews, Esther chapter 8. And you know, I said from the very beginning, I believe every prophetic parable in the Bible follows chronology as you and I understand it. And I've been the subject of this <laughs> many times in my own personal study. So I would suggest to you, when you're developing something in study and it doesn't seem to make sense, sit back, digest it, go over and over it again. I believe it follows chronological order beautifully Every single time, it's just upon you and I to, com to comprehend that. Now, these European nations, the 10 sons of Haman, all the way in chapter 9, what began in chapter 7, just like Joshua hanged the rulers over the nations after his initial entrance into the land. So Brother Mansfield says this, great student of the Bible, and Daniel, expositor, <coughs> excuse me, Following the destruction of the Gogian Confederacy in Armageddon, the Catholic countries of Europe, the wilderness, right, will regroup under the beast, 10 kings, who will prepare to resist the demands and ultimatum of the king in Jerusalem, who's already brought down Gog in Armageddon. But without waiting for them to attack, hang on just a second, I think I cite this. Um, brethren, if you don't have this book, it's called Events Subsequent to the Return of Christ. It's by Jim Cowley. You can get a PDF version of it um, all over the internet. Many brethren have posted it. It's called Events Subsequent to the Return of Christ. <clears throat> when Christ returns, the chronological events subsequent of what happens in the process of time. We're just finishing this up in our Ecclesia for our midweek Bible study. It's very, very good. Just in case I forget to mention that. I know that kind of 
interrupted Brother Mansfield's quote with that statement. Where was I? Ah, prepare to resist the demands and ultimatum uh, of the king in Jerusalem. That's Mordecai, the one given the authority in the king by the king. Without waiting for them to attack, he will invade their territories without waiting for them to attack. He will invade their territories and so rebuke strong nations afar off. In this work of conquest, he will use Israel after the flesh, officered by Esther. She's the one that makes this request by the saints. And so reformed into a new sharp threshing instrument designed to thresh the nations. Thus, the dragon headed by Russia will be overthrown as a political force, but it will not end the opposition to the reign of Christ. Also, this is Brother Mansfield again, H.P. Mansfield and the Expositor. But will not end the opposition. A European confederacy of the Catholic countries, there is the ten sons of Haman. The apocalyptic beast will oppose a rising power of Israel and is in Israel under Christ and make war with the Lamb. Christ, however, will take the initiative and he will rebuke the, the nations, strong nations afar off. He will take the initiative. Esther doesn't wait for it. She knows there's still a decree that has gone forth. There's still hatred and a device among the people to destroy the Jews. She takes initiative. This is following Haman when he is brought down in Esther chapter 7. Mordecai is lifted up. And many people of the land become Jews and the Jews recognize him. Now Esther chapter 9, Esther, with those restored Jews in Shushan, begins the offensive. He will again, quotes Micah 4, 3, rebuke strong nations afar off. His army will move against Catholic Europe and bring it into subjection as predicted in Revelation 19. And I mentioned to, this, to people in the world, in the workplace, all the time, they say, well, you know, the United States is a Christian country. I mean, it isn't so much. You, you know, what, we all know what we mean by that. But we know how they quote it. And I always am quick to correct them. And I say, yes, I, I'm not disagreeing with that. But I want to clarify that. It's like Britain. It is a Protestant country. You could not be elected to the Supreme Court. You really could not get political position until John F. Kennedy, you cannot be president if you were Catholic in this country. It was a Protestant country. So that's different, brothers and sisters. And so Micah talks about <clears throat> this time where they seek the house of the God of Jacob, and of course he will make Israel, the latter part of the quote, the first dominion in the kingdom. Israel will be the first dominion, the little kingdom of Judah. Is Christ reigned first in Judah, and then all of Israel is brought unto him. And that same pattern, by the way, is in Joseph, which God willing will pick up in course of time, where Joseph reveals himself to Judah, but he still has to retrieve Israel, his father, who's outside the land. So there are two phases of that restoration. It's the same thing here, of course. For the Jews that were in Shushan gathered themselves together, 14th day in the month of Adar, and slew, again, 300 men at Shushan. On the prey they laid not their hand, but the other Jews that were in the king's provinces, not in Jerusalem and Jud Judah, where the prophets designate those two pieces as Judah and Ephraim, the Jews in the land and outside the land, gathered themselves together and stood for their lives and had rest for their enemies and slew their foes 70 and 5,000. It's a significantly higher number. But they, again, laid out their hands on the prey. So it, here's the two phases of it again, brothers and sisters. They're unified by an enemy and they're unified by a king. They have a common king. That they will be brought together as one stick in the hands, Ezekiel 37, of course. Be brought together as one stick in his hand, and they have a common enemy. There are nations and a multitude, a majority of them, that do not want to see them established as a nation with this sort of might. And so the prophets say, I have bent Judah and filled the bow with Ephraim. 
So it's the Judah strength and the Ephraim that goes forth in this concept of now subduing the nations. And that's what you have. The remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many people. These are now the Jews that are in the provinces, brothers and sisters. As I said, we're just going to read the commentary of the actual record. Here's a novel idea, right? Read the Bible itself and just apply the prophetic word to it. Here's the remnant of Jacob that is in the midst of many people as the dew of Yahweh, showers of the grass, and the remnant of Jacob shall be among the Gentiles in the midst of many peoples a lion among the beasts of the forest. And they will tread down and tear in pieces, and they will beat back the waves, as the prophet says. They're called the battle axe, the weapon of war that will break in pieces the nations in Jeremiah. And with them, he will destroy the nations. Remember, with the saints marshalling this order. Elijah has an operative part in that as well. Arise and thresh, daughter of Zion. Again, continuing in that context of Micah chapter 4, where the Gentiles are going to be subdued. And of course, the first dominion of the kingdom is going to be um, the daughter of Zion, uh, uh, Judah. And I will make thy host as brass, and thou shalt beat in pieces the people. And you will get all of this, by the way, the subsequent, the events subsequent in chronological order. And that book uh, by uh, Uncle Jim Cowley. It's very, very well, well put together. As I said, we're going through it right now in our Middle East study class. So it's a goodly horse in battle, Zechariah 10 says. They will pass through the sea of affliction and smite the waves of the sea. We know what the sea represents. It represents the nations, especially the roaring and the foaming of the nations, antagonistic to the dry land of Israel. Israel passed through in dry land. When they left Egypt, when they entered the land, they pushed back the river that overflowed its banks and passed through on dry land. Israel represents the earth of dry land, and of course, the nations antagonistic to that represents the sea. And the sheep Gentile nations that are somewhat friendly or enlightened by Israel are the isles that wait for his law. Of, uh, his laws of fire law, little uh, far off, little pockets of land that have been influenced by the Jews in the sea of nations. And of course, it's with Psalm 110. And you know, you think to yourself, brethren, this is the most quoted psalm in the New Testament scriptures. If the Christian world, you know what I mean by that term, secular Christian world, if they were just to continue the quote, Yahweh said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until. I might thou enemies thy footstool. Yahweh will send for the rod of strength out of Zion. He will rule in the midst of his enemies. The people will be willing in that day of his power, the beauties of holiness in the womb. Yahweh at thy right hand to strike through the kings of the day of his wrath. But that doesn't agree with what they like because they like to be involved in temporal things and politics. He will judge among the heathen. That is every nation that is not Jewish. It's a Gentile term. He will fill the places with dead bodies and wound the heads of many countries. Well, it doesn't agree with their philosophy. If it's only love that he comes back, gentle Jesus, meek and mild, is the only way. That's how he came as his first advent. That's how he's coming into his second advent. It's not true. And even Christadelphians that only slice the part of prophecy that speaks of that beauty, which is true, but it only addresses that portion, they really are not addressing the overwhelming majority of Bible prophecy that deals with what we're addressing today. But the Jews that were in Shushan assembled together on the 13th day, the 14th day, and the 15th day, three days, making it a feast of gladness. And the Jews of the villages that dwelt in unwalled towns, where's that language? Made the 14th day of Adar a day of gladness and feasting, a good day, and sending portions one to another. They rested. And there are three days of this. And isn't that what Hosea says? First and second day, the third day, he will, we will be lifted up and we will live in his sight. And the feasting and the gladness of salvation, you can look at all those references that support that, and the sending portions representing the fellowship of reigning over a mutual enemy and a purpose unified of Yahweh's salvation. 
this sending portions, brothers and sisters, and we're going to quote it now because I think we do have time today to quote it because we referred to it before. This is used in Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah, the king's cupbearer, goes away, comes back again. You will see the type there. And we referred to this chapter before, and we're going to cite it. Here's Nehemiah chapter 8. This is Christ enlightening his brethren from the law. He testified of all things of the law, the prophets and psalms concerning himself. And he turned the sin and death and condemnation of the law into redemption and atonement. All the people gathered themselves together as one man into Christ, into the street that was before the water gate. It's the word. They spake to Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses. Here's the law of Moses, which Yahweh commanded Israel. As the priest brought the law before the congregation of men and women, all that could understand, the first day of the seventh month, significant, he read therein before the street that was before the water gate, the water of the word, from morning until the midday, before the men and women, those that could understand. And the ears of the people now are attentive to hear the book of the law. But he does something with the book of the law. Ezra the scribe stands on a platform of wood. The death of Christ. Which was made for this purpose. And he opened the book in the sight of all the people for he was above all people. You crucify me, I will lead all men unto me. And when he opened it, the people stood up. Then opened he their understanding that they would understand the law, prophets, and psalms, and all things concerning him. The death of Christ was the key. We've just been reading it in John. He showed them that he would die and be resurrected. They said, oh, now, Lord, and I'm paraphrasing, but this is fairly close, what we just read in John. Now thou no more speaketh unto us in Proverbs, but speaketh unto us plainly. The key to understanding Proverbs or parables, same word, was unlocked by the death and resurrection of Christ. And Ezra blessed Yahweh and the great people, the great God, and all the people answered, amen, amen, with lifting up of their hands. Bowing their heads, worship God with their faces, and Levites caused the people to understand the law. The people stood in their place, so they read the book in the law of God distinctly, and they gave it sense, causing them to understand what was different. It was the platform of war, brothers and sisters. It was the death of Christ that opened their eyes. Now, Nehemiah. We have Ezra, the priest, the scribe, the religious. Now, Nehemiah, the governor, or church, as it says, here is a Melchizedek. Here is a political religious assembly. And Ezra, the priest, the scribe. And the Levites taught the people, said unto the people, the day is holy unto Yahweh. Mourn not, nor weep, because the people wept when they heard the words of the law. What do you and I do? It manifested sin, so that it's exceeding sinful. We don't deny that the New Testament scriptures in Christ provide atonement and preach everywhere mercy and long suffering in all the wonderful characteristics of Yahweh. But the law did manifest sin and therefore sin and death. But that's not the word that comes from those that gave understanding from the wood. Of right interpretation of the law, they said, go your way, eat fat, drink the sweet, send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. Isn't that interesting? The day is holy unto our Lord. 
Don't be sorry. The joy of Yahweh is your strength. It's redemption, brothers and sisters. When our heart smites us is when we can have redemption. So the Levites stilled all the people and said, hold your peace. The day is holy. Don't be grieved. All the people went their way, eating and drinking and sending portions and made a great mirth and celebration because they understood the words that were declared unto them. You have to understand Christ in the law and prophets and Psalms. It's the key. So that when the heart smites us, we understand how, what was provided how it was provided and by what means and when it was provided. And so that atonement is made. Mordecai, here's the writing of the new covenant, wrote these things and sent letters to all Jews in all the provinces, both nigh and far, to establish this among them that they should keep the 14th month of Adar, I'm sorry, the 14th day in the month of Adar and the 15th day of the same. It's not according to the law that was written when they came out of Egypt by the hand of Moses, but it's the new covenant for the house of Israel that I write in their inward parts and in their hearts, I will be their God and they will be my people. It's the writing now that is by now the hand of this redeemer, Mordecai. It's now gone unto the Jews. As the days wherein the Jews rested from their enemies on the month, which was turned from them from sorrow to joy, from mourning to a good day, they made it a day of feasting and joy and sending portions one to another and gifts to the poor. This is fellowship. This is now looking to Abraham, your father, and Sarah that bear you when Yahweh has comforted Zion and joy and gladness is found therein. And they've rested. And that period is striking in the Bible, brothers and sisters. It is a time that is used in reference in Hebrews chapter 4. Check me on this if you'd like. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, where it's talking about the literal creation and resting on the seventh day, and then it immediately injects the insertion of Joshua inheriting the land, which Moses could not bring them into inheritance, and speaks of Joshua's inheritance as the seventh day Sabbath rest. It's talking about an inheritance of the land, that great day of rest that was prophesied, in Genesis chapter 2, after the six days of work, I think I've already mentioned, according to what we know, this month of Adar is the sixth month of the civil calendar. And so the Jews undertook to do as they had begun. It's Mordecai I've written, because Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy's Jews, had devised against the Jews to destroy, casting purr and lot to consume them. And when Esther came before the king, she commanded by letters that this wicked device, which was devised against them, would be returned upon their own heads. He and his sons to be hanged in the gallows, and they called it the days of Purim after the name of Purim. We've already talked about this, brothers and sisters. Purim is not something written in the law. It is a new law that is written that came during the period of the silver kingdom of the Medo Persians that brought down Babylon. It's a new law. The Jews ordained and took upon them, upon their seed, and upon all that joined themselves unto them. Zechariah says that. Many nations will be joined unto Yahweh in that day. Scriptures we've already looked at. Many of the people of the land became Jews. They are embracing, taking the hold of the skirt of him that is Jew. Let's go up to the house of the God of Jacob. Not only politically, religiously, the nations are being corrected, brothers and sisters. And according to their point in time every year, it's an annual thing. Like the Feast of Tabernacles, as we have in Zechariah 14, it has got to be acknowledged. 
These days should be remembered, kept throughout every generation, every family, every province. It is something that begins in the household that also has a nation application. But the days of Purim that should not fail from among the Jews, nor the memorial of them perish and their seed. It's a very significant time, brothers and sisters. It's a total conversion of people that were once stiff-necked that will lead to the, of course, the correction of all the nations of the Gentiles. What a significant time this will be. And as we've talked about before, no need to quote this. When the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness, we've already talked about the many people in the lands becoming Jews. So Esther the queen, the daughter of the father of might, and Mordecai I would do. It's saints ruling with Christ. And that term, by the way, brothers and sisters, Esther the queen, that phrase, not just the queen, not just Esther, that phrase, Esther the queen, appears 12 times. Here's the Israel of God. She writes with all authority. She confirms the second letter. And the letter is sent to all the Jews in the Abrahamic Sarah, Sarah provinces of 127 in the kingdom. With the words of peace and truth. Isn't that remarkable? It's the Jews being grafted now back in to their own natural root, the Abrahamic. We looked at how Esther began with that phrase, deliberately telling us it was 127 provinces. And that is number that is only used elsewhere for Sarah, not Hagar. The Jew that was born under the law of Hagar the Egyptian, which represented the old covenant, but it's 127 used in this place, which appears three times in Esther. It's the covenant number. It's the Jews being grafted back in to the Abrahamic Sarah root that they've embraced. And peace and truth go forth. And you know what peace and truth means. Jeremiah 33 tells us. It's when he'll cause the captivity of Judah and the captivity of Israel to return. And peace and truth, as we've talked about in other references, cannot be achieved unless there is purity. It is first pure, then it is peaceable. Melchizedek is pure first, the king of righteousness, and it says that. First, the king of righteousness. After that, I'm quoting, the king of Salem, which is the king of peace. First righteousness, then peace. Was it not with Jezebel? How can there be peace as long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts continue? We cannot ignore the detailed process to achieve this. We cannot speak lightness of the prophetic word. Well, it's all just about a beautified earth. When the, all the curse of the earth has been lifted, and the beauty has gone forth, and it's nothing but sunshine. And it, that is a description of the kingdom, but it has a very detailed development working toward that end. And so we make our way in chapter 10. And brother, we could just read the chapter with no commentary. It is so clearly what we embrace as truth. So King Ahasuerus lays a tribute upon all the land, as, Christ, as Solomon did, by the way, and Christ will do at his return upon the isles of the sea. And the purpose of that, like David, when he subdued the nations, built up a financial stockpile of all the metals for the temple building. It says the kings of Tarshish and the isles, and here it is, the isles of the sea, will bring presents. The king is Sheba, and Sheba will offer gifts, and they will fall down before him, and all nations will serve him. 
The abundance of the sea, says Isaiah 40, and you will know your margin, says, will be converted and the wealth of the Gentiles will come into me. And again, you get that in the son of David's, in its first application with Solomon, and certainly with Christ, in its prophetic parable fulfillment. But Solomon did that, where the wealth of the Gentiles was used to build the temple, the place of worship. And the isles don't just mean the Gentiles, but generally those that are considerate of the Jews and align themselves with the hope of Israel. And all the acts of his power and his might and the declaration of the greatness of Esther. Is that what it says, brothers and sisters? Mordecai. Mordecai. It's about the Redeemer. The man that suffered persecution who was exalted in his defense of the honor of the king, his refusal to bow before flesh, his figure to death, resurrection, and exaltation, and all the greatness of Mordecai and how the king advanced him. Are they not written in an exact quote for the kings of Israel and Judah? An exact quote used throughout multiple times, first and second kings. Are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of the silver empire? Every book of the Bible, says Brother H.P. Mansfield, in some way has attention and focus upon the person and mission of the Lord Jesus Christ. He came to fulfill the volume of the book, all the law, and the prophets, and the Psalms. It's Ezra reading the law upon the platform of wood that gave them understanding. And that's what we believe, brothers and sisters. And Mordecai, not Esther, Mordecai, the Jew, last verse, was next unto the king. It's like Joseph was exalted, next under the king. Daniel was exalted, and we totally reject the Trinity, that God and Christ are one and the same. They are not. One is the Father, one is the Son. One exalted and gave supreme authority to the one that made himself a servant, and for that reason, every knee will bow before him, and God hath highly exalted him and given him a name above every name, but he is not equal with God. And therefore he was great among the Jews, accepted among the multitude of his brethren, seeking the welfare or the wealth of his people, speaking peace to all the seed. Now, brothers and sisters, we know Paul uses it in Romans concerning his brethren. He is absolutely speaking of his natural brethren Israel, the Jews. My desire for my brethren, those of the Jews, is that they would receive Christ. And I'm paraphrasing that latter part. But in its complete sense, brethren is a term that is used for those that have embraced the law and grace. He's not ashamed to call us brethren. Brethren is a very intimate term. It's those that have accepted Mordecai figuratively, Christ as the Messiah. Not just as natural brethren. He's turned them into real brethren. Which is exactly why, again, you have the parabolic prophecy of Joseph. His natural brethren put him to death. In reconciliation, he embraces them as brethren after his crucifixion and resurrection. And so he's seeking the wealth, same word good and welfare of his people, and speaking peace to all his seed. It's called the gospel of peace, brothers and sisters. It's intended to unify. They'll have one shepherd, even my servant David. Why David? Because the Davidic covenant promised a man that would come. 
And David's kingdom in literal action was also a prophetic parable of one that would come and begin his reign in the little kingdom of Judah and then ultimately bring the restoration of his brethren. He would establish a kingdom by shedding much blood and then subdue the nations and dedicate their wealth for the building up of the temple of Yahweh so that his death, 1 Kings chapter 1, would result in him rising out of the deathbed and appointing Solomon king to establish his kingdom as a continuous reign over all of Israel. And with them, he says, I will make a covenant of peace and I will cause evil beasts to cease out of the land. You know, that represents the carnivorous Gentile nations. David, my servant, will be king over them. They will have one shepherd. I will make the covenant of peace with them. And on and on and on. I will place them in the place that I've established and multiply them and set my sanctuary in the midst of this. After he's taking out the Gentiles and people of his name, after this, Acts chapter 15, as you well know, he will build again the tabernacle of David that has fallen. So Esther has another name. It's mentioned one time. It's called Hadassah. But it's literally the root myrtle tree. So I thought you'd enjoy this, brethren and sisters. I do. It's what Brother Thomas says in the mid-1800s about the myrtle tree. In their rebelliousness, the Jews are regarded as briars and thorns. He's right. We follow that prophetically. But in restoration, because of righteousness, Olive branches, pine branches, myrtle branches, and palm branches. But you notice the myrtle branches. When, therefore, it is prophesied in Isaiah 55, instead of the thorn will come up the fir tree, and instead of the briar, the myrtle tree, it shall be to Jehovah for a name, for an aeon memorial, thou shalt not be cut off. And again, of course, in chapter 41. I will plant in the wilderness the cedar, the shitta tree, the myrtle tree, and the olive tree. I will set in the desert the fir tree, the pine, and the box tree together. They shall see and know and consider and understand together. So they were supposed to look at these trees and comprehend what they meant. That the hand of Yahweh, Jehovah, hath done this. The Holy One of Israel hath created it. When these things are declared, it not only imports that the land previously Desolate has now become like the land of Eden, the garden of Yahweh, but that the inhabitants in the Messiah's Olam, the period of the millennial Aeon, shall be trees of righteousness, the planting of Yahweh, that he might be glorified. Hold that. So I looked into this. And the good thing is, you find a lot of quotes. Zechariah chapter one. And I saw by night, behold, a man riding upon a red horse. He stood among the myrtle trees. And that, of course, is the vision of the horses. And the man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, these are they whom Yahweh has sent to walk to and fro the earth. The horses, right? And they answered, then answered, I'm sorry, they answered the angel of Yahweh that stood among the myrtle trees that walked to and fro through the earth. Behold, all the earth sitteth still and is at rest. And the angel of Yahweh answered and said, Yahweh surveyeth, Yahweh of armies, how long wilt thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and the city of Judah? This is the question of the angel among the myrtle trees. Against that which had the indignation, 70 years, the Babylonian captivity. You know when Zechariah prophesies. And Yahweh answered the angel that talked with me with good words and comfortable words. 
And the angel that communed with me said, cry thou, saying, thus saith Yahweh Sadeath, Yahweh of armies, I am jealous for Jerusalem, for Zion, with great jealousy, thus saith Yahweh, I return to Jerusalem, with mercies my house shall be built, saith Yahweh, Sabaoth, Yahweh of armies, Yahweh of hosts. There's all the vision that is given in the view of the myrtle trees. And that, brothers and sisters, is exactly what we understand and believe concerning the first principles of the kingdom of God brought forth in the parabolic prophecy of the book of Esther. Thank you.